So what I want to talk today about is iterative solvers for linear systems. So you remember the last time we talked about direct solvers for linear systems, and this is the other family, the second family of methods for solving this problem AX equals B. We assume that the matrix is square. In some cases, we'll assume it's symmetric and positive definite as before. In some cases, we don't have to assume that. Just to remind you where we are in, in the context, so we, before we talked about numerical integration, we said how to convert it into a nonlinear minimization problem. We, we went over to Newton's method, right? And the key, the bottleneck of Newton's method is solving exactly this problem, A, A, X equals B, solving a system of linear equations, right? And the last time we talked about the family of methods called direct solvers, which are algebraic methods that work by factoring the matrix A into simpler subblocks. <clears throat> And then from these subblocks doing a factor solve approach. Then each of the each of the blocks or factors is easy to invert, and that's how you get the solution with the direct methods. So today we'll talk about iterative methods. Uh, so there the approach is kind of similar to general nonlinear optimization. Okay, so you start from some initial guess. Let's call it x zero. So that's my initial guess. You can be wondering what that initial guess is. We talked about it some in the context of nonlinear optimization, right? So if you don't have a, if you don't know any better, you can just say zero is your initial guess, right? But sometimes you run this in, a, in an iteration. You actually always run this like inside the new Newton method, right? So like your past iterate, you can use it as an initial guess. Like anytime you have some intelligent approximation of what the solution could be, you are free to use that. But then the main, the main meat of the method is the iteration, right? So then I can generate a sequence of iterates, x1, x2, x3, and so on, up to some xk. And the idea is that xk, as k goes to infinity, this should converge to x star, and the x star is how do I denote the solution, okay? So my x a x star equals b, where the x star means this is my solution. So just to give you, an, before we go into the specific method, let me give you an overview about different type of iterative solvers you might have heard of. By the way, these methods are used not just in FISBASED, they are um, used much more broadly. It's not just about what we need, need to use it for, is to solve the implicit integration step, but they are used in all, not, and not even just in graphics, in all uh, parts of computer science. And you might, you might have heard it in different uh, contexts. So I, I kind of divide it into three categories. The first are, I would say, classical iterative methods. And you might have heard about names such as Jacobi, uh, Gauss-Seidel, or SOR, that stands for Successive Over Relaxation. That's the first family of method I will talk about. The second is a Krilov subspace method. Krilov, that's a family of methods called Krilov subspace methods. The most well-known uh, example is CG, conjugate gradients, which we'll talk about, hopefully still today. But there are some other methods in this category, like GMRES, MINRES, which you use when the matrix is not symmetric, positive, definite. We'll get into that. And probably the fanciest and most modern of these are multigrid methods, which I will not uh, talk about all, almost at all, except that I will tell you that they exist and how do they relate to uh, the simpler methods. Basically, multigrid methods are a combination of these classical methods and the idea that you can be approximating the solution to the linear system on, on different resolutions. All right, so this is the overview. And we will start uh, with the classical methods. That's the simplest, simplest case, the classical methods, which are based on the idea of splitting or pure iteration. So that's this family of methods, the Jacobi, Gauss-Seidel, SOR. Okay? So for this to work, we need to assume that A is square and invertible. So the squareness, that, that's what I mean by the A is Rn by N. And we, of course, need to assume that it's invertible, otherwise there would be no solution. And the key idea of all of these methods is to split the matrix. Okay, what do I mean by splitting it? I mean, write it as A equals P plus A minus P. 
where p is some approximation to a. Okay, so p is also an uh, n by n matrix, of course. It should also be uh, in invertible. And the idea is really to split this A matrix into some uh, simple part, P, and the rest, okay? Clearly you can see that this identity is, of course, uh, trivially true, right? And how do I turn this into an iterative method? So I'm solving this problem. I'm solving problem AX equals B, okay? Now let's say I split the A into P plus A minus P. So that means that if I plug this in here, so that gives me P plus A minus PX, equals b, right? So I can write this um, also as px equals um, p minus ax plus b, right? I just rearranged the terms. And uh, here is kind of a little trick. How do I turn it into an iterative method? I say, well, let's this, this x, that's going to be my previous iterate, and this is going to be the next one, okay? So the the way I turn it into an iteration is like this. I say that PXK plus 1 equals P minus AXK plus B. Okay? So that XK, that means my previous iterate. Whenever I'm starting, that would be my initial guess. Okay? And that the X, XK plus 1 would be the next one. So this is how you compute the iteration. Does it make sense? So, uh, the, for this to work, then P needs to be invertible and needs to be easily invertible, okay? So you need to be able to compute from, from, from this formula, you need, to be quickly compute, you need to be able to quickly compute XK plus 1, okay? So do you have any ideas what we could use for the matrix P? In theory, you can use absolutely anything, right? Actually, let's, let's think about the extreme choices first. What would be the extreme choices? It's like... In algebra, you always have like two trivial extreme cases, right? What, what would that be? Hmm? British? All yeah, all zeros. That would be a perfectly valid extreme case, right? In which case you have accomplished nothing by this because you are just back to solving the, the original problem, right? So in this case, this is not really simplifying the problem, but that's exactly right. That's one of the extreme cases, right? All zeros. The other extreme case would be would be the entire matrix A, right? Which is uh, uh, similarly ridiculous. Usually that comes up in algebra, right? Like the empty set and the full set, right? And the interesting stuff is somewhere in the middle, okay? So what is some non-trivial, uh, still pretty simple, what, what would be like a more useful choice of P for this method to work? And if you have heard about Jacobi or gauss seidel then you can probably guess, anybody? So the P, the idea is to somehow approximate the matrix A. Just get like a, if I give you a matrix and I ask you, hey, give me, not, it doesn't have to be exactly the same matrix, but it needs to be something I can invert very quickly. The last time we talked about the matrices which are easily invertible, right? That was the basic building blocks of direct solvers. So the, uh, the simplest uh, case would be that you just take the diagonal of matrix A, okay, kind of like in, in MATLAB notation, that you keep just the diagonal and you zero out everything else, okay, this is my matrix A, here there's some A11, A22, and so on, then you just keep that and you say, hey, erase the all the off diagonal elements and this is going to be my P, okay, so I just write it, uh, I just write it like this as a diagonal of P, and clearly if I do this, then the inversion of P is easy, right? I need to assume that none of the elements on the diagonal is zero. The, if, if it was, then, then this wouldn't work, right? But if that, that is the case, if the P is invertible, then clearly I can very easily solve each of the iterations, right? That everybody sees that. That's also one of the building blocks of the direct solvers we talked about the last time, right? So it turns out if you do this, then this is called exactly the Jacobi method or Jacobi iteration, okay? One of the basic uh, iterative solvers. So that's one possibility. There is another possibility, of course. Do you have any other idea how to approximate the matrix A while being able to quickly invert the P? What would be like, so the diagonal obviously is very crude, right? If you want to do like a little bit better approximation, you have other choices. 
Exactly, yes, Trevor. You could do upper or lower triangle, that's perfect. So let's let's say it doesn't make a difference whether it's upper or lower, especially if it's symmetric, right? Well, actually, it, if it's not symmetric, it could theoretically make a difference, but conceptually, it's the same thing, right? Low. So let's say we just use lower triangle of A. So it's a similar idea like with the diagonal, except that we erase all the elements above the main diagonal. So we keep, we keep it, all these elements below the main diagonal, all these become zeros, okay? So in this case, this is called uh, gauss seidel And what becomes the solve? So if P is lower triangular, that's what we had the last time, what the solve, how, how do I quickly solve the system of equations? How do I quickly invert P? It's not as simple as in the diagonal case, right? But it's still much simpler than in case of a regular matrix. So that's the forward substitution process, right? Or it's rather the backward substitution that would be for the upper triangle. So that's what the gauss uh, seidel method does. All right, so there are, and you can come up with different choices of P. You could do like a banded matrix. And there are, there are some more sophisticated approximations, but these are the most common ones. So let's uh, take a look at the following question. How well does this work and when does it work? First of all, of course, the P needs to be invertible, but that's not enough, okay? For this to work, um, we need uh, certain special properties of the P. And when it works, then we can be also asking how quickly does it converge? How many iterations here do I need to make until I converge reasonably close to my solution, okay? So let's take a look at this. So uh, to quantify this question, how well does it work, we can look at an error term, okay? Error term EK, that's simply the distance from my solution, so the X star, that's, that's the solution, okay? That's the perfect solution. And uh, I compute the difference from the X star and the current iterate XK, okay? That's, that's, that's what's called an error. Now there is a problem with this, <laughs> you see the problem? The problem is that you don't know what X star is, right? Otherwise, if you, if you knew it, you wouldn't have to be solving it, right? It's a bit of a chick, chicken and egg problem. So the one way how you can, sometimes this is actually not a problem because you can often reason about the error directly, even without knowing explicitly what this X star is. I'll, I'll show you how that works. If that is a problem, then you can work with residual. And what is a residual RK? That's basically the, or that's exactly the error scaled by the A matrix, okay? So A, E, K. So that means that it is A, X star minus A, X, K. But aha, remember, X star, that was the exact solution, okay? A, X star is B. So this is nothing but B minus A, X, K, okay? And that is easy to compute. I, don't, I no longer need to know what X star was. I can always, if I give you an XK, you know what B is, you know what A is, right? That's your input. So you can compute exactly what this residual is. You can compute the residual at the very first iterate for your initial guess. If you happen to be lucky and the residual was zero, you're done, right? Because you happen to have a solution immediately. So if the residual, if RK equals zero, you're done. All right, so let's use, so we can actually, interestingly, we can use the error directly without going to the residual. Later on, we will need the residual too uh, when we talk about conjugate gradients. But to analyze this simple, uh, like this is sometimes called splitting method because you split the A into P and A minus P, like into sum of two matrices. So let's take a look how we can analyze the convergence of, of this family of methods that includes Jacobi and Gauss-Seidel and also SOR, which is a modification of the two, which I'll explain in a moment. All right, so let's take a look at this. So PXK plus one. Uh, so this is how the iteration works, okay? Each, each of them, depending on what the P is. This is exactly what I wrote here. That's the key idea of, the, of this family of methods. Okay, and um, of course you can, uh, we can also do this. We know that A X star equals B, right? That's my assumption for, for the solution, right? And I know that A splits into A plus P minus A X star equals B, right? Oh, wait a second. 
P plus A minus B. Sorry, I did it the wrong way. I split it the wrong way. P plus A minus A minus B. This is the right way. Okay. So this tells me that P X star plus A minus P X star equals B. I can um, I can put this in a similar form as here. So I can put it like P X star uh, equals P minus A X star plus B, okay? And now this is interesting. This is kind of the trick in the convergence analysis of these methods. This is, or this is the iteration rule, okay? This is how the method works. This is how from X K U compute X K plus one, okay? And this thing is something that is always true, okay? That's the property of the solution, okay? Here comes the trick. I can subtract the two formulas, okay? So if I subtract them, I will get this. I'll get P X K plus one. Oh, sorry, I, I messed up the notation here. This was supposed to be X K plus one down here. It's just the indices. Sometimes I write them on the top, sometimes I write them on the bottom. Here I actually messed it up. Does it look right? P X K plus one minus x star. So what I'm doing, I'm taking this equation and I'm subtracting this equation from it. Okay, both of them are true. Sure enough, I can subtract them and it's also going to be true, right? So this is going to be uh, p minus a x k minus x star. And the reason why I'm doing this is that these two, these b's, they subtract away. They disappear. Okay, they cancel. And look what we have here. This is xk plus 1 minus x uh, star. And here we have xk minus x star. Okay. So up, this is actually exactly the minus error, minus e k plus 1. This is the error of the k plus 1 iterate. And here I have p minus a. And this is the error of a k iterate with a minus. So this would be a minus e of k. Okay, this is just by the definition of error. The error is nothing but the distance of my iterate from the exact solution. Okay, everybody see that? The minus is just a technicality, right? I can just multiply the whole thing by minus one and I just see that P uh, EK plus one equals P minus A EK. So we have a, here we have a formula for how the error changes between iterates, okay? And I can, because I assume that P is invertible, if it wasn't, this method wouldn't work at all, right? So then I can write that EK plus one equals P inverse P minus A E of K, okay? I can further simplify this. I can um, multiply it out. So P inverse P is identity. And here I have P inverse A, okay? So this is a formula for how the error term changes between iterations, okay? If we want this method to converge, then this thing needs to go to zero as k goes to infinity, okay? So that means that this matrix right here is of critical importance, okay? Let me call this matrix M, because then, then all, all the error really does is that ek is nothing but M to the power of k of e0. Okay, everybody sees that, that's just a sim sim simple recurrence. It's actually similar to what we saw at the very beginning of the course when we are looking at ordinary differential equations. It was kind of a similar idea, so if you still uh, remember that. If, if not, it doesn't, doesn't matter. We can just uh, reason about this from scratch. So uh, let me ask you this way. What we want is for the limit for k going to infinity, the ek going to zero, okay? When is this going to be true? Clearly, it will depend on the M matrix, right? You can kind of see. So the E0, you kind of, you, the, the way you control E0 is by uh, controlling the initial guess, OK? If you don't have a great way to pick an initial guess, you just pick some initial guess, you can essentially assume that the E0 is random. Let's say you don't have any useful information about what the E0 is, OK? Now what you can control is this M matrix, right? Because you get to pick this P and you get a different M matrix. And the question is, 
for what which M matrices this will converge, for which M matrices this uh, error term will tend to zero as the number of iterations tends to infinity. I'm just restating this question. Any ideas? And the hint is it's very similar to what we had at the very beginning of the course about the stability of differential equations, even in the continuous case, even without any discretization, just like pure continuous differential equation. Trevor, anyone else has an idea? I know you got. All right. That's right, that's right. They are exactly on the right track. It's totally something to do with eigenvalues. And what is it? <laughs> so I can, I can write the, um, I can, let's see, let's say I can do eigen decomposition, which I can always do because it's a square matrix and I'm not saying it's a real eigen decomposition, okay? It can be a complex eigen decomposition. Uh, we talked about this, right? So that means that these Q, lambda, and Q matrices, they can be complex matrices. Actually, in this thing, I think that's what, it should be a conjugate transpose in the complex case, but that, that doesn't matter. What really matters is the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues, so this lambda matrix has these eigenvalues in it, lambda 1 to lambda n, right? They can be complex. And what is a sufficient condition for the method to converge? Now you know, let's let's say you know what these eigenvalues are. Anyone else? So you need to look what happens with the matrix when you take the higher powers of this, okay? So what, what happens if I take m squared? Well, I get q lambda q transpose and then m again, right? So q lambda q transpose, which is Q, this thing, this thing disappears, the QDQ, that's identity, so I have lambda square Q transpose, okay? So clearly for M to the power of K, I get Q lambda to the power of K, Q transpose, okay? I want this whole thing go to zero, okay? I would, because I don't know what E0 can be. E0 can potentially be anything, okay? So I would like for any E0, I would like this to go to zero. Well, for this, this should go to zero, right? So when is that going to be the case? What is the sufficient condition? You can kind of see this here, right? This, yep. Exactly, yes. Exactly, this thing needs to go to zero and that's gonna be the case if the absolute value of all of the eigenvalues, so for each i, it's true that the absolute value is strictly less than one. That's a sufficient condition, okay? This is actually such an important uh, thing. It even has a name. This is called the spectral radius of a matrix. Spectral radius of matrix M. And uh, you, it usually is denoted as row of M. And what it is, it's the maximum of the absolute value of all the eigenvalues of that matrix, okay, over I. So again, we are talking about square matrices. Uh, complex eigen decomposition exists. You can compute the absolute value. It's going to be a real number. You pick the maximum of it. That's called the uh, spectral radius of the matrix. If this is less than one, you, you are guaranteed the method will converge regardless of your initial guess. Okay. Now, this is actually even more important than that because it also tells you how quickly does it converge, right? How quickly does this error tend to zero, zero depending on the magnitude of the eigenvalues? So let me, let me like give you an example. For example, if you have the matrix M, so let's say you have got some matrix A, you computed some approximation P, you formed this matrix M, you computed the spectral radius, and you found it's 0.9. How well will this converge? And if I do this again, and let's say I compute the spectral radius, and I see something like 0 0.99999, something like this, how well would that converge? Anyone else? Exactly. Here, so in the first case, Jessica, that's right, in this first case, this will converge pretty fast. You're guaranteed, regardless of the initial guess, you're guaranteed this will, this will go to zero fairly fast, right? This, not so fast. 
because this is very close to one, right? You might still get lucky. You might still get lucky if you have a good initial guess, okay? So this is only like kind of like a worst case analysis, like kind of kind of crude, crude analysis. But unless you know anything special about the initial guess, that's that's kind of a good 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 thing to go with. So what we what we would like the spectral radius of the iteration matrix M to be as small as possible, okay? And uh, how how can we how can we accomplish this using this family of methods is by tweaking the p, right? As I told you, we have these choices of p, and we can try different p's, and we can see what spectral radius we will get. You would actually usually not try to compute the spectral radius; you just try to run the iteration and see see how that works. And it's an entirely reasonable thing to try all these choices and see which will work best on your uh, specific problem. Okay. So there are these two methods, the Jacobi and uh, Gauss-Seidel. There is also a third method, which is like a combination of the two, where you say that P is the diagonal of A, it's kind of like a blend of the two, plus omega times the lower triangle of A, we make it consistent, where omega is a tweaking parameter, okay? Usually it's set less than two. And this is called, so this is basically a blend of the two. The solve doesn't get much more complicated, right, because it's still a lower, lower triangle, except that there is this funny parameter. The idea is to do like an overcorrection. And this is called uh, SOR, successive over relaxation. Okay, and this was developed because this, this matrix P, if you use this, then the iteration matrix M, this one, usually has smaller spectral radius. And you can tweak this, this omega so you can get even smaller spectral radius. So that's the idea of this first family of methods of these classical, classical iterations, okay? And there are like some tweaking knobs so you can improve the convergence, but usually you, you try this and you exhaust all these tweaking possibilities and then you conclude that these methods are a little bit too simple. Basically, it doesn't really converge super fast. Even though um, I wouldn't discount anything, just, just, just like this, there's like a fairly recent trend at SIGGRAPH. There were some papers which were proposing fast physics-based solvers using exactly these methods because, because the, since they are so simple, like the Jacobi, that's super simple, right? The implementation, this, this inversion of a diagonal matrix, that's a joke, right? Doesn't even have to be a matrix, you are just dividing by all the diagonal elements. So it's perfect for GPU implementations. And there was some, some very recent, I think this is still a topic of current research, kind of deciding which of these solvers work best for what kind of physics-based simulations. And there was some work that was using the Jacobi highly parallelized on the GPU and they got very nice results. So don't discount some method just because it's too simple. Even though if you read to like numerical linear algebra textbooks, that's what they will tell you, that these methods are a little bit too simple. And that's if you want faster convergence, you need to go to some of these more advanced methods, the Krylov subspace methods or multigrid. And that's what I want to do next, is to move on to the Krylov subspace methods, unless you have some more questions to this classical iteration. So this is one way, probably the simplest way, how you can iteratively solve a system of linear equation. Start with the Jacobi meta. By the way, there are many more convergence results you can you can read up if if you if you dig deeper. There are like some conditions of if the matrix is like strictly diagonally dominant, then the Jacobi converges. Then there are some results that the Gauss Seidel converges if the matrix is positive definite, and so on. There is like a lot of lot of theory about this. I'm not gonna go into the details. <laughs> the yeah, this is the M. This is identity minus P inverse A. And the idea was that that's the matrix that multiplies my error term every iteration. And I guess here is how you can kind of see how this is inefficient, right? Because what, what happens with the error term, so the error term gets uh, projected onto the spectrum of the matrix. The Q is the matrix of the eigenvalues, uh, sorry, eigenvectors. So this is essentially what, what happens is a spectral decomposition of the error term. And then each of the frequencies get multiplied by the eigenvalues, okay? 
So actually, what uh, if you try this in practice, what you will see is that high frequencies of the error term, they vanish pretty quickly. That's because of how the spectrum of this M usually looks like, how these eigenvalues are usually distributed, okay? So the lambdas corresponding to high frequencies are usually pretty small. So the high frequencies in the error are usually killed pretty quickly by this iteration. The problem is with the low frequencies in the error, these like smoothly varying signs, if, if, if you imagine a spectral decomposition of the error, uh, and it turns out that the typical matrices, and they don't kill them very quickly at all. It's more of like the, if it works, it's more like the 0 0.999 kind of situation. That's, that's, that's where you're at. And that's exactly why multigrid was invented. And the idea of multigrid, I'm not going to go into details. You can actually take um, Professor Hari Sundar. He's the expert on multigrid methods here. And uh, I would go to him if you want to have more details on multigrid. But I can give you at least the high-level idea. The high-level idea is to combine this basic iteration with solving this on multiple scales, multiple resolutions, okay? Here, this basic iterative method does not care about the, the structure of your degrees of freedom. It doesn't know anything about what this X actually is, okay? But when you are simulating some physical system, this X is typically like state of, for example, of a piece of cloth, okay? It can have 10,000 degrees of freedom. There would be like a bunch of vertices. Each of them would have X, Y, Z coordinates. There could be 30,000 of them easily, right? And the frequencies I was talking about, they correspond to the frequencies you have on the cloth. If it has some fine, fine scale wrinkles, then those would be high frequencies. If it's just some sort of like very slowly varying deformations, those would be the low frequencies. So what you can do is to do exactly these kind of methods but do them on a lower resolution of the grid. So instead of 100 by 100 cloth, you can do a 50 by 50 cloth. Then you can do 25 by 25. And then you can reduce it further and further. At some point, you will stop. And that's, that's really the key idea of multigrid methods. Essentially, apply these classical iterations, such as Jacobi or Gauss-Seidel, on multiple levels of the hierarchies. Okay, So have a nested hierarchy of resolutions, typically factor of two. And on each of the levels, do a little bit of this of this simple iteration. That's one way how you can make the low frequencies uh, in the error disappear faster than by these simple iterations. It gets pretty complicated, this multigrid stuff, as you can, you can get an idea already, right? As you are doing this hierarchy of resolutions, there are uh, many parameters you need to decide. For example, how many iterations are we doing on each level of hierarchy? How do, how do different levels are going to be communicating? How my coarse cloth is going to be propagating information to the higher resolution cloth and the other way around, okay? So there are many things that need to align perfectly so the multigrid method performs well, okay? So it gets, it gets a little bit tricky and it's hard to get it right, but if you get it right, then it works very fast. What I would like to tell you uh, instead is the Krylov subspace methods, like conjugate gradients which actually works similarly well to multigrade in our typical physics-based problems, uh, but are much easier to implement and understand. Okay, so that's pragmatically, that's, that's the next thing I would try in case these classical iterations are not working well for you. Okay, so to get into conjugate gradients, it uh, helps to actually start with something we talked about before, and that's steepest descent. So let me call this steepest descent and conjugate gradients. Typically, you just hear CG. But I will give you I will give you the short version of the story conjugate gradient. If you are interested in the long version, then I uh, recommend Shuchak, 1994. It has a funny funny title. It's an introduction to CG without the agonizing paint. And I think the title reflects the frustration of the author, Jonathan Shuchek from Berkeley, that all the previous numerical textbooks, they were making it very confusing to understand the CG. So he wrote this very nice, about 50, 60 pages tutorial, which goes into the details of CG and explains you each of the steps. What I will do today, I will just explain you in, in broad strokes how, how it works, kind of 
looking at the forest as opposed to the individual trees. If you want to understand all the individual bits, then I recommend going to this tutorial. So the key idea, or one way how you can derive this, is by interpreting solving a system of mineral equations as an optimization problem. Let's make some assumptions here. So let's make an assumption that A is symmetric and positive definite. This is what corresponds to the conjugate gradients case. Then there are more advanced cryo subspace methods that can remove uh, these uh, constraints, but they get more complicated. Okay, so let's uh, let's not worry about the more complicated cases now and make these simplifying assumptions that lead to CG. Oh, also, and that's actually something I wanted to mention and forgot already in in these classical methods. Usually, you use these when the matrix is sparse. Okay. When it, we talked about it in the context of direct solvers, and all these things still apply. You still want to be exploiting the structure of the matrix A. So whenever the matrix is sparse, meaning it has only few non-zero elements, you uh, want to uh, write down your numerical linear algebra so it takes advantage of the sparsity. Okay? Otherwise, you would be uh, leaving lots of performance on the table. Conjugate gradients is, I think, almost exclusively used for sparse matrices. Okay, if it was a dense matrix, you are probably better off going with a direct solver. So those are the assumptions. And so the key idea here is to rewrite this problem, this AX equals B. By the way, by symmetric also means that automatically it's square. Okay, it's N by N, just like before. So the key idea is to rewrite this as a variational problem, as an optimization problem. Specifically, this is, this is kind of easy in this case. I can write it as this minimization problem. Minimizing a function g of x, where g of x is 1 half x transpose ax minus, oops, that's not what I intended, minus x db. Okay. So this is a quadratic function, and clearly minimizing this quadratic function is equivalent to solving the system of linear equations. Does everybody see why? This is, by the way, the same thing we had before when we talked about implicit integrators, and I told you that the best way to solve them is by converting them into an optimization problem. Okay? So this is the same idea, but applied to a system of linear equations. So this this kind of this is a common theme that like comes up several uh, many times that if you have you have some problem which is a uh, solving some equations and you can convert it into a minimization problem and it turns out that looking at it as a minimization problem as minimizing some some function g which is a function of this type will give you will lead to uh, better methods in this case it will lead to eventually the conjugate gradient solver. So this is equivalent, uh, obviously, because if I, because the critical point, so I assume that the A is symmetric and positive definite, right? So that means this quadratic form is convex. So it has a unique minimum, and the unique minimum is characterized by the gradient being equal to zero, right? But what is the gradient of G at X? Well, that's exactly AX minus B, right? So AX minus B equals zero. That's the, that's the problem we started with. Okay, so let's start. So now, now we converted it to an optimization problem. So now uh, we can apply all we know from uh, minimization to this, right? So we can, uh, this is what we talked about before in the context of G being an arbitrary, complicated, nonlinear function, okay? So this is actually a simpler case where the G is a quadratic function that to convex quadratic, okay? It's convex because the Hessian of G, that's the A matrix, and I assume it's symmetric and positive definite. Okay? So how can we minimize this? How can we... Now, now we have this objective, right? So we can use any of the methods we talked about before. We can use uh, descent methods to minimize this. The simplest uh, case being a gradient descent or steepest descent, which means that you just uh, descend in a direction of the gradient at every iterand. So again, it's an iterative method, right? So you start with x0, then you do x, x1, x2, up to some xk. And every point, you compute the descent direction by computing the gradient of the function g at your xk. Okay? 
This is what we talked about before. Uh, once you have the descent direction, then you compute the step size. You, you, you step in uh, using that step size and you get your new iterand. So that's exactly the same like scheme like we had before, descent methods, okay? So here is the interesting bit, uh, the gradient of G, so what we are basically gonna do, this is, this is gonna be exactly the same method like we talked about before, but the special thing here is that this has such a simple form, which lends itself to many important simplifications. Okay, so we are no longer minimizing an arbitrary function G, we are minimizing a very special, we are minimizing a convex quadratic function G. Okay, so that's a very special case, which will uh, lead to many uh, important simplifications. The one of them is actually right here, okay? The computing the gradient of G is actually very simple, right? What, what is the gradient of G at some iterate xk? Well, the gradient is this. The gradient is ax minus b, right? So at iterate xk, this is just axk minus b, okay? Which, by the way, this is what I called residual before, I guess with minus, okay? Oh, you know, you know where the minus where I lost the minus? <laughs> I missed one thing when I was explaining this descent method. What was that? Why the discrepancy? So remember, we talked about descent methods, right? That minimize an arbitrary function starting at some point x0, computing the gradient, and going in the direction of the gradient. What did I miss there? I missed the, the exactly. I missed the minus. That's yeah. right, James. Yes, and that's 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 why I was a little surprised. Why 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 I have the minus here, right? Mm -hmm. The descent method cannot go in the direction of the gradient. It needs to go in the direction of the minus gradient because we want to be descending. The gradient points in the direction of steepest increase of the function. We want to be minimizing, so we are going in the direction of maximum decrease. That's that's exactly what the descent method is. Okay, so this is exactly so the a x uh, so this is the minus residual and we want to be stepping in, in the minus uh, direction of this so in the direction of the residual okay so that's the interesting thing the residual that's one way uh, how I can evaluate progress of the iterative method okay remember we talked about the error the error we cannot compute because we don't know what the x star is residual very easy to compute okay and that's the interesting bit, the residual with a minus is exactly the gradient. Okay, so that's the first interesting insight you can get from looking at this, uh, at this as an optimization problem, that the gradient of the objective of the optimization problem, the G function, is actually exactly a residual. Okay, let me even write it out. The residual is minus gradient. All right, so computing the gradient is easy. That's, that's just this ax minus b. So that's the first step of any descent method, okay? Now, um, actually, let's, let's uh, go a little bit lower level. We talked about the numerical linear algebra before, right? Uh, it turns out that computing this ax minus b, that's going to be the bottleneck of the conjugate gradient solver, okay? So here, when you are computing uh, the gradient, aka minus residual, it's important to make this fast, okay? The bottleneck, obviously, is computing the matrix vector product axk. I give you a vector xk, and you need to give me the matrix vector product axk. Here, it's very important to take advantage of the structure of the matrix A, because if the matrix A is sparse, you can compute this much faster than if the matrix A was dense, or if it was sparse and you were not taking advantage of the structure, okay? So that, this, this, this matrix vector product, or mat vec product, it's very important to uh, optimize this. And here is an interesting uh, fact about all these methods, steepest descent and conjugate gradients. It actually turns out that you don't need to have the matrix A explicitly stored in memory. Okay, this is uh, initially like counterintuitive. This is sometimes called matrix 
free solvers. And that's actually one of the advantages of uh, these iterative methods. You don't have to have the A matrix in memory. All you need to have is a function that computes this matrix vector product, A times X. Okay? All you need is a piece of code that computes A times X. For this, of course, you can do it by storing the matrix A in memory, right? And then have some fast routines that do the matrix vector multiplication. But you don't have to do it that way. You can actually compute the values of the matrix A on the fly and immediately use them to multiply with the values in X. Okay? And that's actually how some of these solvers are written. If you are using some existing conjugate gradient solver, sometimes you don't pass it the matrix A as, as like some compressed uh, row storage or compressed column storage. You just give it a pointer to a function that computes this matrix vector product. Okay. So that's 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 sometimes an important advantage over the direct solver. So just keep it in mind that even though I keep writing this AXK, that doesn't mean that you need to have this matrix A explicitly represented. Okay. Anyway, on the on the level of this is an implementation kind of thing, an important like um, software development consideration. For as as far as the mathematics and the analysis is is concerned, it doesn't matter. You are computing the a times x in, in whatever way. Okay? Alright, so this way we computed the descent direction. It's the minus, uh, so it's, it's exactly the residual. And now we need to compute the step. Okay, how far in this direction do we want to go from iterate xk? It turns out that, again, we can take advantage of the fact that this is such a simple form, this is such a special function, that actually here we can afford to do exact line search. Okay? When we talked before about optimization, we talked about all these line search methods, I recommended the backtracking line search method, but they assume that this is a more complicated function. If this is a quadratic function, it turns out that the exact line search is not very hard to do at all, and that's what all of these methods are using. Okay, so if your objective is quadratic, we can solve for the optimal uh, step size. How do we do this? It's actually kind of easy. Once we have committed to a descent direction, let me call it R, like the residual, then what you need to do is to be minimizing uh, uh, this. Actually, let me use a piece of notation. Oh, I may write it out. X plus alpha R transpose A. X plus alpha R minus x plus alpha r uh, transposed b, okay? So what this means is that I have now, uh, this, is, this is my current iterate, this is where I currently am, this is the x, this is the uh, descent direction r, or it's, or it's negation, that doesn't matter right now, that's the descent direction I committed to, and now I'm looking for the optimal step alpha in this direction I want to take, okay? So that's a one-dimensional optimization problem. And because this objective function in this case was quadratic, no surprise, this is going to be also a quadratic function. This time, one-dimensional quadratic function. Okay, so that's how it gets, that's how it gets simple. By the way, let me make a little bit of a simplification here. You can see that the notation is a little bit redundant, right? So let me write this as x plus alpha r in the a norm squared. Okay, it's just a matter of notation. Basically, the notation I'm using this instead of writing or let's write this with some z. Z transpose a z. I can write it as the square norm in a norm. Okay. This is really just to avoid duplicating the, the symbols. <laughs> All right, so I want to solve an exact line search. So I want to find an alpha that exactly minimizes this. How do I do it? That's the usual, the usual recipe. This is now a one-dimensional function. It's a function of alpha. I want to find its minimum. I know it's a convex function because I assume that A is symmetric positive definite. That means it's convex. So there is no funny business going on with non-convexity like we discussed before. So how do we do that? Come on, you know this. <laughs> yes, it is. That's that's all it is. It's taking the derivative with respect to alpha and setting it to zero. That's 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 all there is. So let me let me do that. 
So I take this and I differentiate it by alpha. So what do I get? I differentiate the first term, right? I get R transpose A X plus alpha R. Okay, then that would be the other the other thing, but that's 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 symmetric. So this one half goes away, and I have this there twice, just like we always do. And here is just minus R T B. Okay, and I set this to zero. So what I've done, I've taken this, differentiated by alpha, set to zero. Okay, that's 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 it. Now I'm just gonna um, write it out. So this is gonna be R transpose A X plus alpha, oh, you know what, let me write it like this, let me write it minus r transposed b, and here is the remaining term, this is going to be plus alpha r transpose a r, okay, did I do it right, check on, yeah, I think so, you agree, I just expanded it, nothing, nothing too fancy, so take a look at this, this is R transpose AX minus B. The R, by the way, remember that's the residual, okay? That's what I defined down here. R with K or without K or whatever, it, it's B minus AX, K if you will. Oh, so this AX minus B, that is, that is the residual, okay? So I can write this as RTR plus alpha R transpose AR equals zero. Okay, because this AX minus B, that's the R itself. That's, that's a funny thing that happened there, but that's absolutely true. That's, that's how the residual is defined, okay? Well, from this, it, it's quite easy to compute what the optimal alpha is, right? Because um, the optimal alpha is just going to be minus RTR divided by RTAR. Okay, if, if I wanted, I could write it in, in norms as R squared, the uh, Euclidean norm, and this would be the R in my A norm, if you will. Okay, that kind of doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that this is something I can quite easily compute. The R is easy to compute. The I is just the residual. This is my AX minus B. Okay, for whatever X, easy to compute. Okay, this R squared, the the square norm of R, Euclidean norm of R, also easy to compute, right? Just square all the elements and sum them together. So altogether, the alpha is easy to compute, okay? And that is the optimal uh, line search step. So what I'm going to do is that my xk plus 1 is going to be uh, xk plus alpha rk. That's how I get the next iterand. Okay? So that's the steepest descent method applied to this specific problem, okay? So it's really no different than what we had before when we talked about steepest descent, except the only uh, difference being that now we are applying to a convex quadratic function, which lend, lends itself to some simplifications. One simplification is that the gradient is th this simple formula. The other simplification is that you don't have to do any funny business with the line searches. You can directly compute the exact line search, the perfect line search, okay? So that, that simplifies things. And it's, a, it's also quite a simple formula. All right, so let's take a look how well this works. And if you were paying attention during the previous lectures on uh, general optimization, you can be already guessing this will not work all that great, right? This will have exactly the same problem we talked about before. This is a zigzagging problem that this will usually take many iterations uh, to convergence. So uh, if you are to talk about convergence analysis, So in this context, the speed of convergence is usually expressed in, in this metric. You measure the norm of the error term, but in the A norm, okay? So that's, again, this is just my notation for EK transposed A EK, okay? So this error term is exactly this. That's the distance of my current iterate from the perfect solution. And I give it this A in the middle. So I'm, I measure it in the metric defined by the matrix A. And you can be asking why is this a reasonable metric to be using? 
And the answer is that actually, if you if you write this out like this, uh, if you look at what this actually means, this uh, error uh, in the A matrix. So the error, of course, that's defined as, as we said, uh, this is x k minus x star. The order doesn't matter, right? Because it's a squared norm, so minuses go away. So this is nothing but one half of x k s squared plus I'm just um, expanding this uh, x star in the a norm squared and here is the cross term twice so this is minus x k transpose a x star okay just expanding a quadratic and notice what happened here this a x star that's exactly my b okay and this thing the x x star that's a constant that doesn't depend on k that's the that's the solution okay the iteration doesn't do anything about the solution it's just trying to get to it right but as far as the error is concerned, this is a constant, okay? So all this thing is actually nothing, but let, let, me, let me expand it out to, so you can see it very clearly. This is just x transpose axk minus xk transpose b plus some constant, okay? Well, guess what this is? This is nothing but the objective we have here. Okay, one half x t x x t a x minus x t b. This is exactly, even with the one half, this whole thing. Let me write it like this. This whole thing is g at x k plus a constant. Okay, so this explains you why this metric is reasonable because that's exactly exactly corresponds. Absolutely, some constant that doesn't really matter in optimization. It exactly corresponds to the function we are minimizing. Okay. Meaning, by right, minimizing this norm of the A norm of the error is exactly equivalent to minimizing the G function. Okay, so let me skip a lot of uh, tedious derivation which you can uh, look up in the Shuchek's write up, and I will just show you the convergence result for the steepest descent method. Okay, so the convergence result is expressed exactly in terms of this A norm of the error. And it says this, it says that uh, the squared A norm error of uh, the kth iterate is less than or equal, there's some funny number kappa, I'll explain that in a second, divided by kappa plus one. This is to the power of K. And this is multiplied by the error in the initial guess okay getting to this, this this is a little complicated i'm not gonna derive how that works if you are interested you can look at uh, the shoe checks tutorial what is this kappa thing that's something very important this kappa thing is the ratio between the maximum and minimal eigenvalue of matrix a okay this is uh, called the condition number Of matrix A okay so remember we assume that this matrix A is symmetric and positive definite so it means that all the eigenvalues are uh, real and they have to be larger than zero strictly okay so that means the condition number is well defined the maximum eigenvalue is uh, real and positive and the minimum is also real and positive okay so I can divide them and I get the condition number of the matrix A have you heard about this before, the condition number of matrix A? Do you know like the, lay, um, like the popular interpretation of what this means in English without any eigenvalues and stuff? The condition number is essentially a measure, a number, which tells you how, how close is the matrix to singular, okay? Because in the extreme case, this lambda min would, would, go, would be close to zero if this uh, and this kappa would go to some really huge number. So if this kappa is a huge number, then it means the matrix A is almost singular. Okay, numerically, basically singular. So for the analysis of the convergence of steepest descent, this condition number is important because it gives us an upper bound on. Uh, uh, how quickly does the method converge? So if, and this con this condition number for typical matrices we are uh, dealing with in physics-based animation, this kappa can be fairly high. It can easily be 10 to the 6, it can be 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, 
can be a large number, okay? Especially if you have a higher number of degrees of freedom, higher stiffness, and so on. And what is this going to be? If kappa is a million, what is this going to be? This is going to be million minus one divided by million plus one. So, aha, we are in this kind of regime, and this is something like 0 0.999999, something like this, okay? That means slow convergence. That's, that's basically a long way of saying that this converges slowly. And uh, you already kind of can anticipate this from the previous lectures because we have seen this example where the steepest descent can be doing this painfully slow zigzagging progress towards the solution x star, okay, from our initial guess, x zero. So the same thing happens here. So this is not a good method to use. The reason why I was explaining it is because conjugate gradients, which is an excellent method to use, is essentially a tweak of this method, is a fix of this zigzagging thing. It's basically a very clever trick to avoid this zigzagging, okay? The zigzagging is painful because you are essentially repeating the computations unnecessarily, right? It moves down here, then it goes back up, then it goes down here again, and, and so on. So that's like obviously wasteful. So, uh, and this is the motivation for conjugate gradients. So the idea of conjugate gradients is to pick smarter descent directions than the steepest descent would dictate you to use, okay? So conceptually, it's similar to Newton's method. That's what we had before. Newton's method was also picking a smarter descent direction than steepest descent. Except that here, we cannot use the Newton's method because if we just use the Newton's method, we are back to the original problem, right? <laughs> so we actually would not accomplish anything. So we need to be a little bit more clever about how do we compute the descent directions. Newton's method would mean would, would tell us, hey, solve a linear system, but we already are solving a linear system, so that would actually not be helpful, okay? So instead, the CG is essentially a clever trick how to pick smarter descent directions, okay? So maybe let me first explain what the, con what the conjugation means. The gradients are the gradients we are talking about. That's like in the steepest descent method. The, the residuals are the gradients. You already know what that is. What is the conjugation? So conjugation is a property similar to orthogonality, okay? So formally, about a set of vectors P1 to, I don't know, PL, we can say that these are, or the set of vectors is A conjugate if for every pair of the two of vectors, we have that PI transpose A, PJ is zero, okay? So the set of vectors P1, P2 to PL is A conjugate if every pair of them gives you a zero dot product if you stick in the A matrix in the middle, okay? So this is very similar to orthogonality except for this A matrix in the middle, okay? So conjugation is essentially, so I, identity conjugation would be exactly orthogonality, okay? So this is orthogonality skewed by the A matrix, okay? And there are, there are some basic properties of conjugation. It has actually some similar properties like orthogonality. For example, you can prove, you can look it up in shoe check if you are interested or try it for a homework. If, they, if this is a conjugate, then that implies that the set of vectors is linearly independent. just like orthogonality, okay? And uh, here comes the trick. Here is the entire idea of conjugate uh, gradients. It starts the first descent. It's also a descent method, no, no difference here, okay? And the first direction of uh, conjugate gradients is again just the residual, okay? So the first iteration of conjugate gradients is exactly the same as the first iteration of steepest descent. Okay, the first step is identical. So let me write it here, same as steepest descent. The, then 
let's say we iterated already, we already did some of these uh, descent steps and now we are uh, looking for a descent direction number k, okay? And the idea of conjugate gradients is to make sure that these descent directions are a conjugate. Okay, that's why it's called conjugate uh, gradients. Well, it will also be called conjugate directions, if you if you will. And the idea: how do we compute the descent direction number k? We also use the gradient. The gradient always has some very useful information. But we do this funny trick: we get some, we figure out some parameter beta k. And we blend in the previous descent direction, okay? This pk minus one, that, that what, that's what was before. That's the one we used in just the previous descent step, okay? So the next one is going to be a blend of the previous one with the gradient using some parameter beta. And guess how the beta, uh, beta k is computed? It's computed such that pk minus one and pk are a conjugate. Okay, that basically means that pk minus 1 transpose a, pk equals 0. Okay, so from this formula you figure out what the beta k must be so that these two directions are a conjugate and from this you um, can infer that actually if you do this um, every step then the entire set of the directions you were using, p1, p2, and so on, up to pk, that all of them are a, um, are a conjugate. And how do we compute uh, the beta? I will not derive that, but I will tell you what the formula is. It's actually fairly simple. It's just the residual transpose uh, a pk minus 1 divided by pk minus 1 transposed a pk minus 1. Okay? <clears throat> so this is super easy to compute. You know what pk minus 1 was, right? In the first step you just initialize it. In the next steps you, you know the descent direction you used before. That's, that's all there is. Then you compute the beta k. Very simple. Just some dot products with a matrix in the middle. And from and and then just add it to the residual, right? The residual just a minus a, a x k minus b. Super simple to compute. So you have computed pk. No big deal. Very, very easy computations. Okay. Once you have computed the pk, you say that's my descent direction now. Then I do exact line search as before. Okay. Again, I'm this in this, I'm minimizing the same function, of course. I'm still minimizing this g. There's no reason to use any other line search than the exact line search. So meaning this is how I compute my alpha. Okay. And then I do a step as before alpha plus alpha k plus pk that's how we get my next iterate and i continue that's uh, how conjugate gradients work it has some beautiful properties this method one of the properties is that the iterate uh, xk is actually the argument of the objective we are minimizing over some uh, subspace which is called the krylov or krylov subspace maybe krylov because it's probably a russian so what is the Krylov subspace? That's a, that's a linear uh, span, that's a linear combination of all the descent directions up to the kth one. Okay? So you know that after you have done k iterations, then your current iterate is actually minimizing this objective in a subspace defined by all these previous descent directions. That's essentially a formal way of saying it cannot be zigzagging. Okay, it basically cannot go, it, it cannot go back, you, or you, you cannot go wrong, or you, you don't have to go back and then, then kind of correct it again, because you are always expanding this subspace, and the iterates are successive minimizes over the entire subspace, the crowd subspace. Interesting thing, from this lemma, we saw that uh, they are linearly independent, so actually the matrix A is n by n, so once your iteration count reaches n, you know that you have the entire Rn space, right? I can write it like this. The span of P1 to Pn is exactly the entire uh, space we are working in, okay, Rn. Which actually means that the Xn, your nth iterate, is exactly the solution. There is no other choice, okay? So conjugate, uh, conjugate gradients are actually kind of special because you know 
off the bat without even knowing anything about the A matrix other than the assumptions we made at the beginning, you know that it will converge at most in N iterations and it will be done. Modulo, of course, rounding errors, right? These, these errors are always there, so they will introduce a little bit of an error, but in exact um, arithmetics, in N iterations, you'd be done. You would have the exact solution. Now, the conjugate gradients are usually used for large sparse matrices. It can be also like a million by million matrix. In this case, you don't want to wait million iterations to get your solution. You terminate it earlier. And that is possible because it's an iterative matter. So you, don't, you are not looking necessarily for the perfectly exact solution. You're just looking for a good approximation to the exact solution. It turns out that that you can usually get way earlier. Okay. If you do the same convergence analysis, we, uh, I told you before, for steepest descent, you can write a similar result. Remember, this is what we got for steepest descent. If you do the same thing for um, conjugate gradients, you will get this. So it's the same metric, okay? And you will find out that this is less than or equal the square root of the condition number kappa minus 1 divided by square root of kappa plus 1 to the power of k uh, e0 a squared, okay? So the result, and again, I'm not going to derive this. That takes a while. If you are interested in it, I refer you to Shuchek's tutorial. But I will just uh, give you the punchline here. This is actually very similar to what we had before. The only difference is this 2 here, which is not a big deal. But the big deal is the square root of the condition number. Okay? So if this condition number kappa was a million, the square root is a thousand. And that means this will converge way faster. And that's the reason why conjugate gradients are such a popular method. It converges pretty quickly in practice, for at least for well-conditioned matrices. And it's also super easy to implement. Based on this description, everybody could go and code it up in like an hour in C or whatever your favorite language is. There is one more uh, comment about conjugate gradients. Usually you hear not CG, but PCG, and the P stands for preconditioning, okay? So that's, that's my last comment here, preconditioning. And because that's, that's what is usually used in practice, you don't usually use the vanilla uh, conjugate gradients, you usually use preconditioned conjugate gradients. The idea is simple. Instead of solving AX equals B directly, you solve m inverse ax equals m inverse b, okay? Where this m is a preconditioner. What does it mean, preconditioner? It means some simple matrix that approximates my a, okay? So it's a similar idea like, like what we started with in this splitting methods. This, remember, when we started, we said, hey, this p, that could be some approximation of a. Okay, so the preconditioning is exactly the same idea. And the hope is that after the preconditioning, this M inverse A is going to have a smaller condition number. Okay, you, what you want to do, you want to reduce the condition number of the matrix you will be iterating on. And if you succeed with doing this, if you find a good preconditioner, reduce the condition number, it will converge faster. And of course, for this to be efficient, the preconditioner must be quick to invert, right? Because you have this M inverse here. So uh, the basic preconditioner is M equals the diagonal of A, just like in the simple splitting methods, which is called the Jacobi preconditioner. Just like we had the Jacobi method. Here, and it was also just the diagonal of A. So usually in, in, in a real world, you are not implementing just the vanilla conjugate gradients, but you always use at least the Jacobi preconditioner because it doesn't cost much and improves the convergence. You can be also using more fancy preconditioners. Uh, one, uh, one that is quite popular in graphics is incomplete Koleski. 
if you remember last time we talked about direct solvers, one of the direct solvers was a Koleski decomposition, when for a symmetric uh, positive definite A we decompose it into LL transpose, and that was a direct solver. Now we can say, hey, let's not do the direct solver exactly, let's just do it approximately, so we basically do L approx, L transpose approx, so the idea is this will be just an approximation to the matrix, but then L will be a much simpler, ver the L approx is going to be just an approximation of L. And the approximation you typically do is that you do not allow fill-in. Okay? This L approx has to have the same sparsity pattern as the A matrix to begin with. So basically the approximation means that you zero out lots of non-zero elements in the Kolaski factors. There are fast ways how you can compute these incomplete Kolesky factors, mm -hmm. and they can work uh, as very good preconditioners. And that's, by the way, uh, as I said before, there are combinations, there are hybrid methods. There is not just direct solvers and iterative solvers, there are combinations of the two. This is the most uh, obvious combination. You can use a simplified direct solver as a preconditioner for iterative method, typically mm -hmm. uh, conjugate gradients. There is, by the way, also a multigrid preconditioner, which works uh, really well, where instead of doing a, a direct solver, you can do an incomplete multigrid solve. Uh, then you run into the problem that you have to actually define your multigrid hierarchies and so on. But it's a little bit more forgiving because if you make a little bit of, uh, if you don't have your multigrid tuned perfectly, then the CG will take care of the rest. Okay, so this is a combination of two powerful ideas which is like extremely powerful people in scientific computing use that a lot if they have some crazy large problems which they use which they solve on these on supercomputers but that's already getting uh, beyond the scope of this class so this is uh, all I wanted to tell you today any more questions on this this basically sums up the basic iterative methods where you would go from there would be studying multigrid not going to do that. Usually the CG works really well in physics-based animation. Lots of people are using that. Sometimes the direct solvers work better, especially when the systems are small enough. And sometimes you want to do some combination of the two. So it's good to be aware of all these methods. And uh, if you are struggling with solving something efficiently, try more of them and see how it works on your specific problem. There is no one single solution that would be perfect in all cases. All right. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, we can stop right here.